I will be very strict. I'll ask them to sit down. We want questions on the subject matter that has been spoken tonight by both our learned lecturers. Please use this mic, come forward, put your question and sit down, and please let us know to whom the question is directed, either to Brother Gary Miller or to Brother Ahmad Didat, and then they will answer your questions. Thank you very much. I'm Gary Miller. <laughs> that was the reason. This guy. Right. 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 Or you re now, this expression made by Peter, when Jesus asked, he says, who do you think I am? He said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Now, this expression, son of God, what does it mean? You see, it is not the time to debate. But I will give you an explanation since it's a question. Otherwise, I'm going to ask you and we're going to lengthen this meeting and we won't finish even till, until 12. Son of God, what did it mean to the Jew? Did it mean that God begot a son? How many sons does God have? We are asking our Christian brethren, how many sons has he got? And you'll get the answer, one. I said, it's unfortunate you don't know your Bible. See, God, in the, in the Gospel of St. Luke, chapter 3, you read there the genealogy of Jesus, and it says, and Adam, the son of God. So was Adam the son of God? He must be. Then Jesus Christ, he said, says, all the good people, as, as many as are led by the Spirit of God, are the sons of God. Means every Tom, Dick, and Harry, if you follow the will and plan of God, he is a godly person. In the language of the Jew, he is a son of God. Then you read from the book of Genesis, chapter 6, verse 3, verse three it says, And the sons of God, sins from hot, and the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair, and they took them to wife all that they chose. How many did he have? Many. And when the sons of God 
chapter, verse 6 now, chapter 6, came in unto the daughters of men and bore children to them. They became great men of old, men of renown. How many sons did he have? Many. In the book of Exodus, God says, Israel is my son, even my firstborn. In the book of Jeremiah, he said, Ephraim is my son, even my firstborn. In the book of Psalms, God speaks to David. He said, I will declare a decree unto thee that thou art my son. This day have I begotten thee. So, in the language of the Jew, in the idiom of the Jew, it means nothing more than a goodly person. As far as the Messiah is concerned, we say he was a Messiah. And Messiah doesn't mean God. Because God had Messiahs also by their tongues. In the Bible, you find this word Messiah in Hebrew, you apply for Cyrus, a pagan. In the book of Isaiah, God says, It is I who have surnamed thee, that though thou hast not known me. Means you, a pagan, a mushrik, although you don't know me, I still call you Messiah. But the Christians have translated the word Messiah to anointed. See, wherever it suits them, they retain the word Messiah as Messiah. Whenever it suits them, they translate it as Christ. And whenever it suits them, they translate it as anointed. And you'll find this word Messiah applied to pots and pans and horns and everything. It's here in this book of mine. Christ in Islam. If you like, you can check it up. Dozens of places in the Bible where anything and everything is described as Christ, Messiah. But in your translations, the translators have deceived the people by changing, instead of retaining the word Messiah as Messiah, they would put the word anointed. So it, you think it's something else. But in the original, it's Messiah. In the Greek, it is Christos. Uh, what was the second question? Psalm 110. Oh, Psalms, yes. Now, this prophecy, if it is applied to Jesus, before he was born, this prophecy was made, that come, I will make you to sit on my right hand and make your enemies your footstool. Look, it never happened. Who are his enemies? Who are the enemies of Jesus? Anybody will tell you, the Jews. And they are strutting around in the Middle East, giving endless trouble to my people. They're making the American dog to wag, you know, the tail. Israel is the tail and America is the dog. And whichever the tail wants, the American dog wags, moves around. It's a mighty power. Six million Jews are dictating what to do in the Middle East. That enemy of Jesus, look, where are they? Where is Jesus? Sitting on the right hand of God. Doing what? Waiting. For what? To make his enemy's footstool. 2,000 years. You get a hot pant, you know, you sit down one place. I'm sure some people sitting there now getting hot pants already. 2,000 years the poor man is sitting and waiting for what? His enemies to be made his footstool. I said, look, it doesn't apply to Jesus. It doesn't, can't. Otherwise, it's a very pitiful sight. You, you agree, 2,000 years a man is waiting for his enemies to be made his footstool and they're still strutting around in the world. Pitiful. That gentleman over there. In uh, Mr. Bezzi asking questions because, in fact, I have two questions to ask Mr. Didat. Number one, Mr. Didat, is that you did mention that the Quran is the only book that is unadopted and unchanged. Now, as a Christian, I believe that that's not the case, but I want you to prove me wrong. Uh, since Muslims or Islam refutes some of the basic doctrines of Christianity, which also means that basically it rejects what the Bible teaches, present-day Bible, I would like to ask this question, however. If then what you're saying between the lines is true that the Bible has been changed, I would like to know when and where, and also, I would like also to make mention of this fact, that Mr. Muller mentioned it and quoted from the Quran, that the Quran is sent to confirm that which came before it, but note, it says also to safeguard those scriptures that came before it. Now, if then the Quran is there to 
safe to confirm and safeguard the Bible or the Christian and Jewish scripture that came before it. If the Bible has been changed, it means that the Quran has failed in its duty to safeguard those scriptures. You see, the Holy Quran confirms that Jesus is the Christ. <clears throat> Something worth confirming because the Jews, they insinuated that Jesus Christ, because he had no earthly father, he was the illegitimate child of Mary. So either the Muslim must accept that or accept what the Christian said that his father is God. So the Quran comes to rectify the misconception that the Christian has that because he has no earthly father, his father is God. So it says, Ya Ahl al-Kitab, O people of the book, La taghlu fi dinakum. Do not go to extremes in your religion. Don't go to extremes, you Jews and Christians. You Jews are going to one extreme and the Christians are going to another extreme. Don't go to extremes. Wa la taqulu ala Allah illa al-haq. And don't say anything about God except the truth. And what the truth is? Innam al-Masih, most certainly the Messiah. Isa ibn Maryam, Jesus the son of Mary, Rasulullah is the messenger of God. So it confirms. It rectifies you wherever you made false, wherever you made your interpolations. Your trinity is a fabrication. It says so. That Jesus is the begotten son of God. It says so. You see, it rectifies your mistakes and it tells you, as, as, a, as our brother pointed out, that it is a check on what you, the Christians and the Jews are teaching. So this is what, this is the book of God. It is confirming what is with you, what is true. If you say that God is one, it confirms. If you say adultery is evil, it confirms. That stealing is bad, it confirms. Taking of life, killing people is bad, it confirms. So whatever is right, it confirms, and then wherever you have made mistakes, it corrects you, and then it replaces with the right answer. I am talking about the, those things which the Quran disagrees as far as the Bible is concerned, which ultimately means that the Muslims disagree with the Bible as well. Now, now, excuse me, excuse me. Now that means if it is alleged that the Quran, all right, the confirmation you have to some length explain. But if the Quran is there to safeguard the Bible, then such discrepancy should not be found. I want to know which Bible are you talking about? Because there are dozens and dozens of Bibles, different, different versions. Which one are you talking about? You see, the Roman Catholics, they have what is called the Douay version of the Bible. You know about that, right? And that Bible has 73 books. 73 books. Now, must I accept that one or accept yours? Yours has got 66. You are a Protestant, I take it. Silence. You are a Protestant, I take it. Please, please. Unless you are a Roman Catholic. Are you a Roman Catholic? I know why. I know why. Because now you see, this is the trick that the Christian plays on you. When you want to know where do you belong, are you fish or fowl? And the man won't tell you. <laughs> see, because as soon as you say, as soon as you say that you belong to a certain denomination, I say your denomination was a partner in this Bible, which went on to say that the King James Version has great defects. If you say that you belong to a certain church, I say, look, that church of yours backed this Bible up, which threw out the ascension of Jesus, thrown out, Trinity thrown out, begotten son thrown out. Can you see? So I said, your church was involved. So the easy way out is, I don't own up where I belong. I don't want to say what church I belong to. So it's an easy way out. So you can take any impossible stand, and the man can say nothing to you. Uh, please, give somebody else a chance. Next, Next question. Next. And if you want to ask another question, go at the back. That lady over there. You know, no, I'm not making a speech. We're not here to debate on God's way. 
You see, the right thing for me to do was, was to ask you for an explanation about the verses that you have quoted, which means now you will go into delivering a lecture. You see, what had Ishmael and Isaac to do with Islam and Christianity that we were discussing tonight? Can we go pardon? Yes, yes. No, no, but now what has that sacrifice to do with Islam and Christianity tonight? I beg your pardon? About what? You must tell me now, what did I mock? You see, you're not asking the question, you're creating some new subject now about Ishmael and Isaac. Now, who was now, who was offered for sacrifice? Was it Ishmael or Isaac? I, I, now, I tell you, according to the Bible, that is not true. Because you read there, Isaac, thy only son. And at no time was Isaac the only son of Abraham. You see, 13 years before Isaac was born, Ishmael was born. And God Almighty accepted him as the son and seed of Abraham. No less than 16 places in... I'm sorry, 12 places in the book of Genesis. God speaks about Ishmael. He said, as for Ishmael, I have heard thee. 12 princes shall he beget, and I will make him a great nation, because he is thy son, because, another place, he is thy seed. No less than 12 places. God Almighty accepts Ishmael as the son and seed of Abraham long before Isaac was born, 13 years before Isaac was born. So now, when was Isaac the only son and seed of Abraham? You go and work that out, and next time when I come to Johannesburg, you tell me. This question again is for Mr. Dida. Now, before I actually ask the question, I would just like to say something as I see. Okay, uh, it, is, it is such that both Muslim and Christian believe that God is a just God. Right? What is that? That God is a just God. <laughs> what is the affair of God? What is that? Right. Both Muslims and Christians believed the fact that God is a God of love. Christian, I can forgive you because Jesus Christ died. How in Islam, how 
in Islam is the atonement. And there was no crucifixion. Number two, that he was not God. Number three, that God did not kill an innocent man for your sins. Because this is the most unjust thing to do. <laughs> Can you imagine you go and commit all the crimes in the world and we catch the most innocent man that we can find and hang him? You think God Almighty is such, is such a person, is a, such a being that for Adam's sin, Adam and Eve, they ate the fruit and now he's going to put everybody into hell. And he's going to take his own son, an innocent child, who had done no wrong, and have him hanged. And his poor man doesn't want to die. He's crying, sweating blood. And you know, never mind hook or by crook, get him hanged. Is that God? Is that a loving God? You are a loving father to your child, I take it, if you have any children. And for somebody coming and committing a crime in your house, you go and kill your child for somebody else's crime? <laughs> is that what you do? Because you love this criminal so much, all these sinners. Next man. Next man. Mr. Chairman, as a confirmed atheist, am I allowed to ask two questions, sir? Where distinguished people in the long line of the size of discipline or whatever we have to say. Why is it? Is it possible or is it anyway in the Bible or the Quran that Muhammad is the last one? There will be no further disciples or messiahs thereafter. I don't know if I have interpreted this evening's discussion correctly. But that is my assumption. Right. The question was that it is like the confirmed atheist. That's what he said. Did he say that? Yeah. Which means he doesn't believe in God. Now he wants to know where in the Quran or the Bible it is said that Muhammad is the last prophet. But look, it is not a book of authority for you. Where does it fit you to know? Where <laughs> If you believe either of these books as the word of God, then you have a right to ask whether there is anything in the book, because there is something in the book. You see, in the Holy Quran, we are told Wama Muhammadun illa Rasul, that Muhammad is no more than a messenger. Kat khalat min kabli Rusul. It says many were the messengers that passed away before him. And it says Muhammad is a khatumun nabiin. He is the last and seal of the prophets. There shall be no prophets after him. The Quran says so, but now I don't know how that act can act as an authority for you when you say you don't even believe in God. <laughs> I can't see any relevance unless you are playing a game with us to say you are a confirmed atheist. You just want to put us to the test whether we know our books, we know our onions or not. Right, I think we have answered it and you young man, look. We were... All right, the next, next, next one. Let's have the next one. Right, next one, yes. Muhammad and Christ. Looking at the realities of civilization and of people, if the difference was very minute in terms of religious philosophy, and I think you have stated categorically that on all else we agree, why can't Christians and Muslims get together, set aside that minute difference? Rather conf and confuse our little minds. Why confuse our little minds? Why can't they preach that small difference? Take the 90% of compatibility <laughs> and explore it and teach us the basic ingredient of godliness. Thank you. Very <laughs> good job in fishing in troubled waters. You see. This problem you should pose to the Christians because the Muslim has given his hand. Look, he says Jesus is the Christ. The Muslim says that. The Muslim says that he was the Messiah. 
He says he was born miraculously. That he gave life to the dead by God's permission. He healed those born blind and the lepers. Look, the Muslim is giving his hand of friendship again and again and again. Now this question of yours, this good spirit of yours, you should expend it on your Christian friends. Ask them that, look, since a Muslim is coming forward, why aren't you prepared to give your hand of acceptance and say, look, we also believe that Muhammad is a messenger of God and you, 1,200 million Christians and 1,000 million Muslims get, can get together on a common platform. Now, do that service for mankind. Ask your Christian friends. <laughs> Finish now. Let's close the meeting now. You can't carry on like this. Oh, I see, right. Now. Uh, you also believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And you also. No, we don't believe that. Okay, so I said, I don't believe that. Mr. Leader, just give me a hearing. You people are sarcastic. You don't answer our questions properly. You say that Christ didn't die for your sins, the Muslims, right? Am I right? You Muslims say that Jesus Christ didn't came to die for your sins. Well, we Christians believe that Jesus Christ, Christ died for our sins. And these, these gentlemen, these missionaries, they will not come to ask questions. You know why? Because he said to Reverend James Cunningham that this is scum and we will not join scum. These born again Christians, ask him, Mr. Gilchrist there at the back, ask him what he calls you. Why isn't he coming forward to ask questions? Those missionaries there, why aren't they coming? Why are they putting you forward? What for? They want to make a fool of you. Look. They want to make a fool of you and get away with it. They will not listen to me, listen to me. Look, if you have your bishop or priest of your church, if you have any, you go and arrange a meeting, please, please. You were in the first place, you were not supposed to come to that bike. You remember? He said, look, you were already disqualified and we, in act of charity, we give you an opportunity and you are taking unfair advantage. Please, if you, if you have any church hierarchy, Anybody of your church who's prepared to debate any subject, look, go and get your priests, go and get your missionaries to hire these halls like this and call us and we are prepared to debate with you. Right, gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, the time is up.